while traveling in Namibia, you might come across a mystical phenomenon called fairy circles. And towards the end of the trip, you might even ask yourself, what on earth are fairy circles and how did they come about? Were they created by actual fairies or is this where aliens land with their spaceships? Found on the eastern edge of the Namib Desert, there are thousands upon thousands of fairy circles. We at Kondwana Collection Namibia also wondered ourselves because these fairy circles can be found in Kondwana's Namib Park as well as near Kleinos Vista and quite close to Palambach Lodge. So, when we were approached by a scientist back in 2005 for a research project that included fairy circles, we were more than willing to assist because these fairy circles can be found near Namib Desert Lodge as well. Fast forward 18 years, this scientist is sitting right next to me and he is here to share his findings. Welcome, Professor Norbert Jurgens. Thank you for having me. Professor. Let me elaborate a little bit on your on your introduction and what you've done. You are an internationally renowned biologist from the University of Hamburg, and uh, you were engaged in research in Southern Africa for more than 40 years. So you are clearly the man for the job. Based on your research, you redefined the floral kingdoms of Africa. You also coordinated the establishment of international institutions uh, for researching and monitoring global uh, biodiversity, advising on conservation and sustainable land use, and on combating desertification in Africa and worldwide. Mm -hmm. Before we get into the phenomenon of fairy circles, what sparked your interest in this in the first place? Well, it was pure curiosity and luck. In February 1980, mm -hmm. I had my first trip to the Richtersfeld, and there on that first trip already, I saw these strange bare patches called fairy circles. At that time, I had no idea what it is. But luckily, on that trip already, I started to do what became a life work. I started to monitor the changes in the vegetation. Immediately on your first trip? Yes. I, I Well, it, in practical terms, it means you mark an area, for example, a square of 10 times 10 meter. Mm -hmm with packs or with color paints. So I mm. simply recorded from year to year what's happening. And this included, as I already said, these bloody bare patches <laughs> with nothing in them. <laughs> but it was not always completely bare. And after a good rain, there are plants germinating, some grasses, others. And you see animals, beetles, ants, termites. So I simply carried on to note what's here, what's there. And mm. that went on and on and on. And then I realized, oops, there are animals in the soil. So you start digging mm -hmm. and then you find geckos in the sand at a depth of 50 centimeter. So why is a gecko here? And mm. so on and so on. So the lists of animals were growing <laughs> and growing. And then one day I noted it's not an accident. It's always wetter in the soil underneath the bare patch than the soil around it in mm -hmm. the normal vegetation. Mm. Well, we all call this normal landscape the matrix, hmm? so it's the typical matrix, and we understand the bare patch as the unusual. Hmm? So the matrix was always dry, if not just last week a good rain did fall, mm -hmm. but beneath the bare patch, the soil was always wet, really wet, not a little bit moist. It was moist to an extent that you can form, uh, yeah, forms like balls mm -hmm. with this wet sand. So this was surprising. And then I started to also measure the soil chemistry. Mm -hmm. You collect soil samples, bring them to the lab, and you study, is there salt or whatever? And then this moisture got more and more the main question. And then let me show, I started to use automatic instruments little sensors like what these do you, have here? you can oh, wow. put them into the soil and i did that at different soil depths 10 centimeters 30 centimeters 60 centimeters 90 centimeters and all these sensors mm -hmm. then gave their data into such a data logger okay and all such right. a data logger is good enough with batteries mm -hmm. to sample data for for five years. Since 2008, I have now these time series mm. that 
yeah, every single hour in many depths down to one meter measures the solar humidity. And the astonishing result was they are always moist. Even in pure desert with less than 100 millimeter mean annual rainfall. Deprevir Namib Desert Lodge has 100. But even in, in drier parts of the Namib Desert, that soil is always moist. It's an oasis. It's providing water for life. And that was the most surprising fact. So I've started to measure moisture everywhere. So that was the approach. Mm -hmm. And then I created lists of all the animals I found there. Did you experience any challenges or setbacks during your research? And if so, can you perhaps give us an example? The biggest challenge for me as a person coming from northern Germany, mm -hmm. a, a very humid area where it rains each day. Non-stop. <laughs> Still getting used to the heat then. <laughs> Absolutely. No, the biggest challenge was to understand the desert. And I think many people don't really understand the desert. That's true, yes. And most of the time in the desert, nothing happens. It's just dry and dead. Mm. There are only very rare pulses of life, typically, when the rain falls, uh, like in the Namib in 2011, this mm. fantastic rain year. Well, many people hope that this year, 2023, may become a second 2011. Yeah, and then that water that falls remains there for a while and causes life. Mm. And then a few weeks or a month later, yeah, there's nothing left again. Mm. And to understand the importance of this uh, long, these long periods of no activity took me quite a while. So I went there year by year and nothing happened. And that was frustrating and demotivating. But then suddenly in the years with the good rains, everything happened within four, five weeks time. And that was an eye opener to make it even more interesting. And that helped me to understand you know, yeah, what's happening there. A second, more technical point, I often stranded with cars mm -hmm. because most of the ferry circles are <laughs> in remote areas. That's and right, especially yes. the dunes in Angola were really, really challenging. So over the years, I had to improve my, my driving habits and, <laughs> and buy better cars. Yeah, and maybe another really interesting tiny thing, these data loggers I showed you already. Mm -hmm. I put them into the soil the cables fit in here. Yes. And then they are closed and I surround them with plastic. And then they are waiting 10 centimeter below the soil surface. For me, when I come back after a year or two or three and open them, and now I want to attach my computer and download the data. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, well, let's say every 10th or 15th time, I open them and I see red, moist sand. Really? How can that happen? Even with all the plastic that you covered it up yeah. in and protected it. Yeah. And maybe a bit later, I can tell you about the animal that is able to open this box. Yes. And, and make a home in there. And carry water in it in, into a completely dry soil. It's a strange ability. I was really surprised. Unfortunately, that destroys all the data. I was about so sometimes to ask, I yes. lost a year of data. But mm. this observation that one strange fairy is able to creep into these boxes and uses them to bring water inside was an eye opener as well. I think that adds to the mystical element of why they call it fairy circles as well. Perhaps, <laughs> maybe do. even a little. Okay, so let's have mercy with our viewers who may be dying to hear your findings. Please tell us what or who is creating fairy circles according to your research? What have you found? Well, I hope I still hope it's fairies, but I know it's probably <laughs> not, is it? Well, a different species of fairy. <laughs> now, uh, I think it's not a secret that I'm really, really convinced and have no doubt that a very small termite, the Southern African sand termite, mm -hmm. causes the fairy circles. And I have many, many good proves that this is a fact. And yeah, let me come back to the monitoring. Yes. One of the facts is that after monitoring the animals, the plants, the soil conditions, everything for many years, I started to list 
all these observations. And then in 2013, or it was already 2012, I realized I have now a list where only one organism is found everywhere. And let me add, at that time already, I looked at all the fairy circle populations, mm. including Angola and including South Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or I think this is very important because many fairy circle researchers only look at the ones in Namibia that are most beautiful and maybe the most favorite example to visit. However, the different fairy circles in Angola, the largest on Earth, and the very different ones in the Richtersfeld are, are very, very different. Mm. So even including those, the sand termite was the only organism always found uh, wherever fairy circles exist. So yeah, following the idea of a crime scene, <laughs> <laughs> there was an obvious suspect. And so I followed up the sand termite in detail mm -hmm. since then. And I published that already in 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, others then said, well, maybe it's only a correlation. And that animal is there, but it's not the, the cause, not the originator. However, meanwhile, I also found clear proofs that the sand termites, and I could photograph that and even create movies, videos, yes. showing what's happening there that they attack the roots of the grasses only on this circular bare patch, later called the fairy circle, mm -hmm. and you know, damage and partly eat the roots of these grasses. Mm -hmm. And that causes the death of the grasses short after the rainfall and the germination of the grasses. So the, the annual, the yearly cleaning of the fairy circle that happens two to three weeks after rainfall it's definitely done by sand termites. And we could show that with many details, including mis microscopic pictures of the first attack mm -hmm. at the seed itself and later damaging the whole root system. So I can describe the process. It's not only a suspect who's always found at the crime scene, but you can really see step by step how the grasses get killed there. Yeah. So. Maybe in addition, one more point. Yes. Uh, I could also understand a good reason why the termites do this. And what would that be? <laughs> well, hunger, as usual. Of course, yes. I no. mean, we all have to eat, right? Exactly. But, but that is only the first step. And when sand termites that are restricted to sandy habitats, there must be sandy soil. They never occur on loamy or clay soils, mm -hmm. not on rock. Uh, if sand termites are hungry, they eat the roots above their nest. Well, be careful, they have several nests. They don't have one single nest like the big above ground termite mounds around Organia. Yes, they have several nests in the soil. You can't see them. Really? A system of nests connected by a tunnel system. But they nevertheless have a center around or between the nests and there they eat the roots of the grasses. And that then causes a bare patch. And then I understood this is ingenious. The bare patch is now the entry port for the next rainwater. When the next rain falls, there the rain, as everywhere in the surrounding area, immediately enters the soil surface mm -hmm. and then pours down into the depths, mm -hmm. and that happens rapidly only on sand. That is a very important component. Only sand grains are large enough yes. to have large pores, interspaces between them, yes. and these large pores allow rapid percolation, pouring down of water. This movement is important to reach the depths of at least 30, 40, 50 centimeter rapidly wow. uh, to escape the drying force of the dry air and the sun. But as I said, that happens everywhere in the bare patch cleaned by the termites mm -hmm. who had killed the grasses, but also in the surrounding where now grasses are germinating. But that makes a difference because the germinating grasses in the surrounding, we call it matrix vegetation, those grasses consume the water. 
It's easy. It's easy. It's, yeah, it's obvious. Yeah. And everybody enjoys the green desert and then other plants flower. Mm -hmm. So everybody's happy and Remsbok and Ostrich and Springbok have fodder again. Lovely. Everybody's happy. However, at the same time, these grasses consume the water. And depending on the amount of the rainfall of this one thunderstorm or two thunderstorms, it may be a few weeks or a few months until all the water is gone. And then the system dies back. Mm -hmm. And that is typical. That is desert. Deserts are dead for most of the time. And then short pulses of life after rainfall allow life, but only ephemeral life, short-term life. And then everything dies. But now the termites make a difference. Because they kill the grasses in these meters, there is no competition taking away the water, and yeah. the water remains. Yes. That is a miracle. That, that is, is the most miracle, important yes. thing, an oasis in the soil that allows the termites to live there all the time. Mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> sad, sadly, the termites themselves become the resource, the prey of many carnivorous animals. And now the ants come, and the artfark and, and many other animals who live on termites. And, so the and they also was, yes. are now able to survive in the desert. So one could say wow. the termites are ecosystem engineers that turn desert into permanent grassland with permanent life. Isn't that great? Let me tell you a funny story. When I published this discovery in 2013 mm -hmm. in a quite high level scientific journal, Science, uh, I got angry calls from Canada. Oh, no. <laughs> because, <laughs> why? <laughs> why Canada? Uh, in Northern Europe, but also in Canada, there's one animal that until 2013, mm -hmm. in all textbooks on biology, was the famous example for ecosystem engineering. And here we talk about the beaver. Huh? You ah, know, yes. You know this animal that size? Big teas. Absolutely, yes. Able to cut trees and to turn these trees into a dam. Mm -hmm. And with that activity, the beaver turns a linear channel of a little river, sometimes into a gigantic lake landscape or swamp landscape, mm. which helps the beaver to live and many other animals. So that was the example. And the beaver is famous in Canada. So they yes, were greatly absolutely. disappointed that now a tiny <laughs> subterranean <laughs> termite in an African desert should be better. But I think it, it is better. It, it turns deserts into grassland and life. There are many researchers that were also um, inspired and really taken aback by fairy circles and the phenomenon of it. Mm. And they also made it their business to investigate fairy circles, mm. but they claim that they have never found termites or any traces of them. What do you have to say about that? Well, that may well be. It's, it's not that easy to find sand termites. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm a bit proud to have found them. I, I think I, you should be, yes. <laughs> well, in reality, I only had the privilege with my monitoring projects to go there every year. Yes. And therefore, I had the chance to see in these few good rain years, what they are doing. Most of the time, they are sleeping in the ground <laughs> and not doing anything. So yes, uh, it may well be that other researchers do not find termites. And that depends on the context of the work. It depends on the right timing. And it also depends on the effort they invest. You, you must invest quite a bit of effort yes. and dig deep and wait long until you see that. these termites operate in the shadows. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there are many indicators that enable you to find them. And uh, if you are not so unlucky to be in a severe drought period, for example, around Gobabeb, you know the research station, the famous Gobabeb research station mm -hmm. in Namibia, there has now been drought for 10 years. <coughs> Uh, and those fairy circles do not show termites. At all. I have been there. That's interesting. And those fairy circles between Gobabeb and this beautiful Mirabeb Inselberg, mm -hmm. they had termites in 2012 when I was there. 
and we saw living termite activity. And then a few years later, we could st still see the tunnels, wow. even, I think, 2018. Mm -hmm. But in between, other researchers went there and claimed, correctly so, there were no termites. So that, that is the fact of the drought periods. And whether at that time a queen and a king may still have existed deep in the soil, uh, dormant, waiting for the next <laughs> rain, I don't know. They can survive for quite a number of years, but maybe not 10 years. So there are dead uh, fairy circles with no more uh, living termite colony. But that is not an argument against the termite hypothesis. Uh, otherwise, we would say, well, in a city built of houses made of bricks, we would expect uh, the workers, the bricklayers in each and every house. This is not the fact. They That's only true. are there when they build the house. Exactly. And later, yes. no more bricklayers are found. And this is not an argument against bricklaying as the most important activity to form house. So but it's, it's a perfect example, yeah, to really make us understand. Yeah. Um, okay, Professor, seeing that you are an expert in finding termites, would you mind sharing how can we find termites? Or rather, yes, are there tips and tricks on how you can find termites? Well, you, you have to adjust your eyes, first of all. That is very important in the mm. desert anyway. Uh, you know these ideas of the big five, uh, elephant, etc., every tourist wants to see. Yeah, and... In the desert, you rather look for the tiny five. And to see them <laughs> on the first day, yes. each, each visitor in Namibia has to adjust the eye to find these living stones, etc. And Beautiful. that's a well-known phenomenon that once you have seen the first one, then you see them everywhere. And so you, you have to know where to look, but you can definitely find the tunnels. Uh, not if you dig with a shovel. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I've seen videos where people do this and throw it on the ground. That destroys the tunnels because the tunnels are fragile constructions of sand mm -hmm. stabilized only by a dark tapetum, a wall layer. I, I fear it's shit. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks black typically <laughs> and that nevertheless... <laughs> allows a little bit of stability, but with a, with a spade or a shovel, it's immediately destroyed. It will, it will be destroyed, yeah. yes. We, so we I, have to be I, careful. So I use these leaf blowers to blow the sand away, and then you can see the tunnel system. Uh, yeah, very often when it's really dry, even these tunnels collapse, and then you only see mm -hmm. tunnels underneath stones. So, so things like that are important, to mm -hmm. look underneath stones. Mm -hmm. um, then... Very important, uh, the termites, when they are active, wish to clean their tunnel system at least every 24 hours. And typically they wow. do that in the late night hours and mm -hmm. in the very, very early morning hours because that increases their probability to survive the cleaning activity. Cleaning means they kick dirt out of the tunnel in a vertical tunnel that reaches the soil surface. And there in the morning at sunrise, you can see the sand is moving and then a little sand dump, maybe one centimeter tall, forms. And then very often you see a carnivorous ant coming and running and grabbing a termite worker and carrying the termite worker still living away into the ant nest mm. as far so that's why they do it at night or in the very early morning. And then after doing that, this little soil dump, soil mound remains. Yeah. But only short while because in the heat of the day with the sun, uh, when it dries, the, the soil that comes up is a bit Moist, wet. Yeah. yes. Yeah, but then it fragments and you can't see it anymore. So typically you only can see that well in, in a good rainy season when there's enough moisture in the landscape. Uh, and that allows you to sort of map the activity of the termites in the soil. Mm -hmm. And they are really active in the center of a ferry circle, in the central square meter. Often you have 90 to 100 to 120 tunnel openings on a square meter. Yep. Wow. And then it goes down to the margin, 80, 70, 60, 50. 
Underneath this hedge-like ring of tall grasses that typically surround fairy circles and that also allows to call them fairy rings, the ring of hedge-like grasses. I sometimes use the word luxury belt because it's such a luxurious growth. <laughs> um, yeah, there you can't find tunnel openings. Obviously, the termites somehow understand that this belt, this ring of tall grasses should not be touched. They dive under it, mm. but then in the surrounding grassland, in the metrics, again, you find 20, 30, 40 tunnel openings per square meter because there they eat grasses. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Remember, they destroyed the grasses in the bare patch. Absolutely, yes. They have the water, there they live. There they survive based on the water, but, but there's no eat. food. Yes, exactly. So they get hungry. Yeah. So they have to use the tunnel system to go to the grasses, harvest biomass fodder. But typically the soil there is absolutely dry. So after 24 hours, they get thirsty and have to go back to fill up their body with water again. Yeah. So these little soil dumps, sometimes you can generate, and that is a trick we always use in dry periods. If, when you arrive in the evening and put up your tent, uh, you, you sacrifice one canister of water and pour it at the margin of one fairy circle. And then very often the next morning you see... The little mounds. That was a wake-up call, a termite sitting on the ground, uh, cleaned their tunnel and or, or created a new tunnel, I don't know that, and then you see these fresh tunnels. So tricks like that help you to, uh, to test what's happening there, otherwise you can dig and dig and dig. Critics of the termite theory also claim that sand termites occurs in areas where you do not find fairy circles at all. What do you have to say about that? I agree, the, the fact is correct. Yes. You find sand termites uh, over most of southern Africa even. But we sorry, can, about I, can I interrupt you? What is the Latin term for sand termites? Yeah, well, it, it's uh, the same in Greek, mm -hmm. Psamothermus. Psamothermus is a genus, and there are several species in Africa. Mm -hmm. The southern African sand termite has a Latin name, Psamothermus allocerus. Mm -hmm. And yeah, unfortunately, I have to tell you that there will be more species of Psamothermus in future mm -hmm. because one of our PhD students yes. meanwhile studied the molecular sequence in the genome of sand termites we collected from fairy circles in Namibia, mm -hmm. in Angola, mm -hmm. and in South Africa, and even sand, terms, uh, sand termites from the area outside the fairy circle landscape. Okay, wow. And her study, already published, clearly shows that the sand termite group came from the Cape, so humid, moist Cape like Cape Town, <clears throat> and then evolved the ability to stand dryness, the ability to survive in the desert, mm. in the area which today is between Port Nollos and Lüderitz, so let's call it the uh, Richtersfeld and Spurgebiet or Zaukaib National Park, the Sakhil and Karoo. There, the first fairy circles in time, in evolutionary time, were formed by sand termites. Not in grassland there, but in between woody dwarf shrubs with succulent leaves, mm -hmm. or living stones, plants like that. And that will keep the name Aloceras because that group was collected first at Lüderitz. And then the next evolutionary step was to adapt to a life without wood. And that was happening in the landscape from Namib Desert Lodge, Deep Revere, Zossos Flay, Namib Run, down to Aus. And so step by step, the evolution created new species that could survive. So in future, there will be Psamothermus aloceros, this name you asked me for, only for the species from Lüderitz to Podnodos, and the others will get new names we still, still think about. Okay, okay. but Psamothermus aloceros, the present name, which will become a larger agglomerate, occurs over most of Southern Africa. However, with a focus on the arid west, but also in Namibia, it occurs to the Botswana border. 
And in South Africa, even in Natal, you can find that species if it would have been a species. But we now know there are more species included. Yeah, and the fairy circles, to compare them, only occur in arid landscapes close to the 100 millimeter rainfall per year line. And that runs from mid-Angola along the eastern margin of the Namib Desert. I can show you a map later. Um, yeah, it runs exactly through Namib Desert Lodge de Previer, 100 millimeter. And then at the Orange River, it expands to the east because the Orange River Valley causes additional dryness. And then that line hits the Atlantic Ocean near Port Nodos. So it all fits. That is the area. But around that landscape, you find ferry circles only a little bit further to the dry land and a bit further to the moist land. So say not only at 100 millimeter, but mostly from 50 millimeter to 150 millimeter. And then if you go into moister landscapes, the savannas of East Namibia or Northeast Namibia, you can't find them anymore. And funny enough, this gradient from the perfect desert, where you find the large ferry circles, to the margin is accompanied by shrinking diameters. They get smaller and smaller and smaller, and then they do not exist any longer. And the reason is the termites produce these bare patches only if they need them, you could say. Only then, they only harvest the grass above their nest system. Otherwise, if the soil is moist everywhere, they can go everywhere. There's no reason to be restricted to this area. So, yeah. And then they kill grasses everywhere here and there by eating them, but that does not form a fairy circle. So that is the, the answer. Yes, sand termites come from moist ecosystems where they are wood eaters. In South Africa, they are even regarded as a pest destroying houses. Mm -hmm. And only this specific group of seven or eight species that evolved in the Namib Desert evolved as a new adaptation in time a couple of million years ago, the ability to destroy the grasses on a circular diameter and only then, uh, yeah, these fairy circles. You can even see, and I can show it with some pictures starting in 2007, that the large fairy circles there after the the great rain year, 2011, and you see I've been there very often. And, but then you see the fairy circle gets smaller. Disappears, and in yeah. 2012, already, it's almost no longer existing. Huh? Exactly, yes. Yeah, so fairy circles, to be large, require high aridity. Mm -hmm. And when the landscape gets moist, they shrink. And when the landscape gets very moist, they don't exist any longer because the termite don't produce them because the soil is equally moist everywhere. Mm -hmm. I think it's also a fact that termites need an orientation mm -hmm. to do these daily trips outside and inside. No? They move radially from the bare patch into the matrix vegetation to eat, and then they come back. Radial movements. But where do they find the right direction? Okay, they have their tunnel system. But probably also the gradient of moisture being maximum in the bare patch area in the soil uh, towards uh, dry soil beneath the matrix vegetation plays a role. And if in the landscapes that are moister, the vanna landscapes, everything is moist, that orientation is no longer there. And then the whole circular system doesn't make sense anymore. That's my explanation. I put, for example, at De Previer, uh, automatic cameras, these typical uh, yeah, cameras that take either one shoot per day, and typically I do it at 12 o'clock or in the afternoon to have a, uh, another light at, mm. at four o'clock. Um, <clears throat> and if you do that, you can follow up each and every event Remember that we also put automatic weather stations at all our sites. That is also yeah, a big advantage to understand uh, the whole system. I told you about that observation system. All the books lying here yes. describe these large projects that included 
many, many disciplines. So, mm -hmm. so we have now automatic weather stations that at the hour tell us how much water did fall. Mm -hmm. And then we have these moisture loggers that exactly tell us how quickly the water moves through the soil into the depths. Mm -hmm. uh, we regularly collect soil samples to understand the salinity, the salts, the nutrients. We observe the plants. I mean, all these processes are described and I can therefore step by step describe what happens after the rainfall. It takes very few days, three, four, five days until the first grasses that germinate mm -hmm. uh, are visible at the soil surface. So they kick through the sand. Um, then they produce some leaves. At that time already, the termites attack the seed. I told you about the sand yes. agglomeration around the, the germinating seed. So already there, the first attack takes place. Yes. And then during the subsequent weeks, they even form compacted sand around the roots and eat m larger parts of the roots until the root and the plant dies and is moved away. So all these processes, step by step, can be described because of modern technology, all yeah. these logger systems, etc. But also the observation system that we set up in Namibia, in Angola, in South Africa, which is a complete bio, eco, hydrological observation system. We have all the data to describe the process with each single step. Moving on so, to our next question, you found circles that grow in diameter. Can you explain this as to why? <clears throat> well, I, I just told you that the diameter is not constant. Yeah. They are expanding in some and years and shrinking in, in other others. years. And the main uh, driver, the main controlling power is the amount of moisture that is in the system. But yes, there are periods of time which are at medium moisture level, so not extreme rains, not extreme drought, where you can see that fairy circles grow year by year. And they typically do that by killing a few plants of this hedge-like ring, the luxury belt, on the inner side. So as, a, as an exception of what I told you earlier, they don't touch that, that, that ring. ring at all, yes. Yeah, because that ring is yeah, their reserve for extreme droughts. Mm, mm. Um, when I submitted the first publication to science, my first proposal for the title that later was changed by science was Insects Farming in the Desert. Because <laughs> these insects go there and they first care for the most important resource in the desert, permanent water, by producing that bare patch. And then they allow the growth of a plantation of grasses right next to their nest. And mm -hmm. these grasses are living for many, many years. I know some individual grasses observed in these time series that I know as a person for eight years now. So they survive year by year. Yeah, but sometimes they want to expand the ring and then they eat, as an exception, a series of grasses at the inner margin. And that you can see then the next year because then the remains of the eaten grass tussocks are still there, black, black humps of dead grass material. And then you can see at the outside of the green ring, new grasses now become part of the hedge-like luxury belt because now they have access to the water beneath a perennial, uh, beneath a fairy circle. You remember the water reservoir underneath the bear patch? Yes, yes. Only the grasses that are next to that water can grab a little bit of that water. And so by that, the, the ring can grow slowly and that happens. And I think that is a very important way to also assure the circular form. Hmm? I mean, very often people ask, why is it circular? And I have two answers. The one answer is the movement of the water that everybody knows if you uh, place a line of water on, on a 
paper well uh, moisture a taking absorbing surface yeah, yes yeah then it expands and tries to form a circle no? mm -hmm. that is that are the capillary forces that pull water and if the capillary forces because of homogeneous material are equal in all direction in the end a a circle is formed mm -hmm. that's the one reason the other reason we already discussed the necessity for the termites to be efficient and use their tunnel system to move out for foraging, for eating grass, and to move back for taking up water, that must be short. Mm. And the shortest way would be to remain closest to the water reservoir. And that also urges the termites to make sure that the water reservoir and the, the hedge-like luxury belt remain circular. That is my understanding. So yes, they expand in certain times, mm -hmm. but as I already told, then they can shrink. And that then, funny enough, leaves marks in the landscape. Then the old luxury belt, the old perennial belt, dies because the water is no longer there, but it still remains mm. as blackish stumps. Yeah. And then maybe a second time, a good rain again makes the fairy circle shrink, then a second luxury belt remains. And then you have two double rings. Perhaps you have seen that. There are many aerial photos from the Namib Desert showing fairy circles that have not one ring, but two or three. I'll have to pay attention next time I'm there yeah. to really and, look and at it. And that happens during the, the shrinking phase. That's very interesting. So the dynamics, the, the dynamics, the movements can be explained easily. What is the life expectancy of a fairy circle? <clears throat> uh, that is one of the remaining miracles that need to be studied. Uh, it's not that I cannot give you a figure of life age. Uh, and I can do that based on uh, historical aerial photographs. For example, Marienfluss Valley, 1956. I found an aerial photograph showing all the fairy circles. Then I bought a modern high-resolution satellite photograph mm -hmm. uh, in a program, I put it exactly on top. And then you can easily compare and see who of the fairy circles is still there, mm. who is new and who died. And in that comparison, 1956 to 2006, half a century, there were only very few that died and a few more that appeared newly. Mm. But they were strange enough in a line, what also has a reason. Uh, if I calculate the age of those fairy circles based on the few new ones, I would end up at 200 years average wow. life age. If I use the few ones that disappeared during this half a century, yes. the life age would be in the thousands of years. And so I believe fairy circles can become more than a yeah, thousand years old. However, only the structure and the landscape mm -hmm. that does not say anything about the termite colony. It may be that during that time, many tens or hundreds of termite colonies with new queens mm -hmm. uh, colonized that spot. And that makes the you know, the remaining mystery I have with the observation several cases of fairy circles that disappeared and reappeared That's interesting. in exactly the same spot. Hmm. And to explain that, there are many you know, possible answers. The dormancy is a possible that queens survive very long in the depths. Uh, we cannot measure soil qualities that make a bare patch different from the normal landscape. So it's hard to believe that flying in queens when the termites warm finds the spot of a former fairy circle. I rather believe there are millions of queens that whisk kings try to establish colonies everywhere and then Statistically, only few of them survive and all the others fail. Mm. That may 
be an explanation that qualities of the former fairy circle in the depths of the soil make it more probably that a new colony establishes here. So there we have a problem. So my, 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 my facts are, yes, fairy circles in a given spot can be there for thousands of years. Uh, maybe shorter periods of times south of the central Namib Desert. Mm -hmm. It may be that at the Previa Namib Desert Lodge at Namib Rand, the lifetime is shorter. Remember, there are different termite species that we can Everywhere. now distinguish. Yes. Yeah. yes. But they can reach a very, very high age. How do you explain the hexagon distribution pattern of fairy circles in the plains that it ends up looking like uh, honeycombs? The honeycomb pattern is rather a theoretical explanation. You don't see that in the landscape. No? What you see in the landscape are the, the bare circles. And if you try to connect a surrounding landscape to one fairy circle, like mm -hmm. a territory, then you end up looking at the pattern, which is extremely regular. Then you end up in the assumption of a hexagonal system like honeycombs. And honeycombs you often find in nature where activities expand from a center. Well, an activity expanding from a center forms a circle, like a balloon yes. that you pump up. Yes. However, if many expanding circles in a system all expand and one day uh, touch each other, then the logical pattern is a honeycomb pattern. Because there where two balloons touch each other, the borderline is a straight line. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then the next balloon comes and then you end up with honeycombs. So <clears throat> the regularity makes the assumption of a honeycomb pattern. Uh, I first ever found real honeycomb patterns, and I can show you the pictures, and they are in the book, um, that are hexagonal, but that is a special case only in the Marienfluss Valley, and I could now explain it in detail, it's, it's rather rare. Mm. So what you normally see is the regular pattern uh, that could be seen as fitting into the centers of honeycombs, and that I explained by competition. Termite colonies also keep others at distance. I don't know who, how they do it. They are not aggressive. If I take termites from neighboring colonies, they don't kill each other. Mm. Maybe, and that's most probable, they smell uh, the smell of the other colony. Mm. Because with, again, with our genetic studies, we also could show and prove that all termites within one fairy circle area have the same genetic composition. So they are one clone coming from, not, not a clone, but the same family from the same queen. That makes sense. And yes. then the next fairy circle is different. And typically, the genes also decide on the smell. So okay. probably the smell makes them underground and their tunnel system feel, well, <laughs> I'm now in the wrong area, let's turn. So that's a pattern. Interestingly, I found the same regularity, absolutely regular patterns that can be described as honeycomb patterns in a very, very different ecosystem in the swamp lands of the Kafue National Park in southern Zambia. There, we have a very, very different termite, a termite that creates termite mounds, yes. like your Omayova termite mounds in Namibia, but house size. Can you imagine? A termite mount size. Like of, a house. Yeah. That is incredible. And, and these termites produce these big uh, towers in a swamp landscape that is absolutely equal. You know, swamps are made by water, so the water level makes it even. Mm -hmm. And there also you have the exactly identical regularity as the ferry circles in flat landscapes in the desert. Okay. They are not always regular. The ferry circles in southern Namibia always have a linear system along a dune slope. Uh, so the regularity you only have in very homogeneous, flat, even landscapes in some spots.
Professor, thank you so much for sharing your theory. It's quite interesting, very intricate as well, but you've managed to um, uh, share the information in such a way that makes it very understandable for us. And I see that you have quite a few publications here of books that you've written. Um, I, I know that was one particular book that was published in December, um, and it looks quite scientific, if I have to be honest myself. Who is it for? Well, it's for both, for scientists and for the wider public. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we try to combine everything. It's for scientists because it has been regular, rigorously uh, reviewed by other researchers. Mm -hmm. 17 reviewers had to look at the single chapters and wow. to check them for scientific quality. And, and yeah, I had to, to change quite a number of things, mm -hmm. and also the soil scientists and the microbiologists and the genetic people. Uh, it's a co-production of 15 authors. I'm only the, the main author. Okay. So we have many disciplines. Very important, uh, we have many Southern African entomologists really familiar with insects in Southern Africa. So we are absolutely convinced uh, with the right uh, competent uh, local researchers that the central mites are the, the causators. Yeah, and in addition to that rigorous uh, scientific approach, we added up to almost 800 photos uh, for the wider public. All right, then uh, my last and final question is, you have spent over 16 years trying to figure out fairy circles. What do you, what is in plan for you for the next 16 years? Well, I've already started to write the next book. Already? And, <laughs> and it will be on the flora and vegetation of the entire Namib Desert. It will really be a detailed map of the vegetation with an ecological explanation. And it will also contain a chapter on the evolution. Where do all these plants come from? When did they evolve? How many million years old? Because the Namib Desert is the most interesting desert on this planet. For example, all other deserts are very, very young. Most deserts have a flora which is young tertiary, three, four million years old. Only the Namib Desert is special. You have miracles like Velvicia mirabilis, which has been found in fossil forms in northeast Brazil wow. from 108 million years before today. Oh my goodness. So Velvicia mirabilis is an absolute contradiction to all other deserts on Earth. And I don't know how long it already exists in the desert, but it's still there. So the Namib Desert also in terms of evolution and yeah, creating of new adaptations. Think of the living stones that sink into the soil surface. There are so many miracles that yeah, make me feel the fairy circles uh, are another miracle that just is one building block, one element of this fascinating story of the Namib Desert being older than all other deserts. Well, not maybe not older, but in terms of uninterrupted existence. And therefore, the Namib Desert is the most astonishing desert in the world. That doesn't get anyone interested in the Namib Desert and travel there. I don't know what will. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, thank you so much for taking the time to share your wisdom and to share your findings with us. And um, I hope you don't mind, but we're going to keep calling them fairy circles and we're going to attach the whimsical, mystical element to it still to this day. Thank you for having me. To find out more and celebrate Namibia's beauty and its stunning landscape, make sure to subscribe to Gondwana Collection, Namibia's YouTube channel.